Hi, and welcome to Chitta Chats, uh, an ongoing series of discussions inspired by all things yoga. And my name is Carl Erb. I'm here with Aaron Kennedy, a yoga student and teacher in training. I also am a yoga student and been teaching for a while. And we recently have been working together. I uh, was teaching in her teacher training program. And she's been coming to my public classes and meditations, as well as uh, ongoing discussions about the texts and the ideas and values <clears throat> in yoga philosophy, which we also call Chitta Chats. We meet weekly in San Francisco in a tea house to talk about these things. And out of that arose the impetus to share some of that discussion, which is what we'll explore a little bit today. All right, so Carl, um, one of my burning questions was, <laughs> how did you come to yoga? How did I come to yoga? Does one never come to yoga? <laughs> when I was seven, no. <laughs> I, I got turned on to it in college when I was 19. And uh, I think I did some in high school. I did some Aikido in high school. Um, at the time, I'd already been sort of exposed to the Tao Te Ching and, and some Eastern stuff for whatever reason ways of thinking were interesting to me. and uh, But really, I'd done a bicycle trip across the country. <clears throat> and when I came back from the bicycle trip, my second year in college, I thought, I should do something else with this body that's been pedaling for 12 weeks. And uh, there was a UC Santa Cruz uh, yoga class that <clears throat> they make it easy. You know, it's free, part of the PE program. And my first teacher was Julie Kimball at UC University of California, Santa Cruz. and. Uh, it pretty much immediately became a bi-weekly thing, right out of the gate. And within, you know, a few months, I would come home and be showing my housemates stuff. <laughs> I can bend your leg behind your head. That wasn't at that time, no. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was a strong emphasis. I was a backbend junkie, you know, a sun salutation junkie, like most of us when we get into it at a young age. We did 108 sun salutations every weekend. <clears throat> Saturdays we'd all get together in a circle and each one of us would lead 10 sun salutations. And, uh, yeah. So it was, um, you know, meaning that I didn't come into it. Julie would imbue a lot of quotes and stuff, but I didn't come into a deep study of the Yoga Sutras and Bhagavad Gita. Though I had been exposed to the Bhagavad Gita in high school and uh, with Noel King at Santa Cruz, uh, and I mention these names because I know that some people out there know these people. Noel passed away recently. Um, <clears throat> and I saw some correspondence and articles about him, but he influenced a lot of us. Comparative religion studies and, and that kind of stuff. We got some exposure to the Bhagavad Gita there. But even when I was 11, <laughs> I was doing art classes with a woman uh, <coughs> who now is at Kim Waters. Uh, she was Kim Murray at the time. She's in a duo called Rasa, which again, some of you in the yoga community might be familiar with. And I was doing art lessons with her. And I'm scanning the bookshelf now to see if I have her book. But she illustrated the Bhagavad Gita. It's called The Illuminations of the Bhagavad Gita. And so at age 11, I was looking at these pictures this big of Krishna and the cow and while well, I was doing my art. And she would sing to us songs. And Again, it, you know, nothing like my understanding of the Bhagavad Gita now. Just it was over my head, and, and you know, but she was pretty wrapped up in it. And I lost track of her for decades, <clears throat> and cross paths. Uh, uh, at some fluke, I went to a kirtan in Marin and, and didn't know she was going to be there, and recognized her right away. And it had been, you know, decades. So that was a wonderful reconnecting, and I, it just felt like this whole cycle, twenty some odd year cycle of my life, had. I said, I was like, oh yeah, you know, so depending on, so I find it quite surprising that now I'm teaching the Bhagavad Gita, influenced by Swami Dayananda Saraswati and stuff. But the yoga asana, I was in college, and uh, it was big fun. So I guess leading into that next question is, um, when did you become, begin to delve more deeply into the philosophy and structure behind yoga, and how did you choose your teachers? Oh. 
they, 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 they say that, you know, when we're ready, the teacher shows up. What does that mean? I don't know. In a sense, it's not so willful or planned or reason for things. I got introduced to Ramanam Patel by Julie Kimball in Santa Cruz. <clears throat> he used to come to the campus and uh, he was living in Santa Cruz at the time. This was uh, early 80s, mid 80s. And um, we would go over to his place in San Jose on occasion. And uh, so I kind of stuck with him. When I moved to San Francisco, I went to the Yangar Yoga Institute and uh, enrolled in the advanced studies program. I'd been doing yoga for six, eight years at that point. In college, I didn't really know I wanted to teach, but I've always been someone who shares what I'm learning. Played school with my sister, taught her mythology. <laughs> you know, not long after I knew how to read. <laughs> And, and was teaching her about the Greek gods and stuff. And in high school, I was a tutor. I, you know, uh, <clears throat> led what we called student-directed seminars in college. I planned college courses on American Indian politics. So I was always teaching. I went back to teach Greek mythology at my high school. So, although I didn't go into it saying I'm going to be a yoga teacher, to some degree, looking at that pattern, it was somewhat inevitable that something that I started pursuing, I would end up sharing. But I started teaching when my uh, teacher, Evelia Howard, um, well, Julie first asked me to step in and stuff for her when she was traveling in, in college. And then uh, Evelia Howard I met here in San Francisco. <coughs> um, she was at that space that we still currently use and teach at, at on Divisadero. It's now the Yoga Loft. And um, I did get exposed to a fair amount of teachers. Why did I stick with Ramanan? <laughs> yeah, you know, because I did, did stick with him through, again, decades, and apprenticed with him, observed him. Evelia, too, had a lot to offer, particularly around back hair and therapeutics. So it was their deep knowledge, their ability to communicate what they knew. Um, and probably, you know, looking back, those teachers that just really didn't muddy the teaching with a lot of other things that are so prevalent in the yoga market today. They were just because they couldn't help but. And not that, you know, that's the bad thing. It, it, it naturally arises. The market supports spreading this education is a beautiful thing. But <clears throat> there was something just in their presence that it was clear that yoga had touched them. Um, so. And I tend to want to gravitate to the experienced teachers. I mean, Ramanan was training the faculty at the Iyengar Institute at the time, too. And uh, I did get exposed to other methods. I spent some time with uh, people who taught in the Vinyasa system, uh, uh, the Shadow Yoga system, Shandor. These people I would, you know, go and do three-month or month-long intensives with a lot of different people through the years. But when I say a, a teacher-student relationship, it was a weekly relationship. It's not I go see somebody once a year, once a month, you know, for a month, and, and uh, I learned a lot from those workshops, for sure, but I wouldn't call that my teacher-student relationship, you know. The people that I'm talking about, I did private lessons with, I apprenticed with them, I observed them teaching, you know. Uh, so that was an ongoing evolution. So they were very present through all kinds of things in my life. Yeah, um... You practice many aspects of yoga and share that practice with people in many different ways. And um, what aspects do you find most inspiring and exciting and fun? What are you calling aspects? If well, I may, uh, you uh, and share meditation classes. You. Uh, share the chit chats on Thursday nights. How uh, kirtan is also, I believe, an aspect of your practice. Yes. Although I've never had you explicitly say that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, kirtan is the devotional expression through song. Song has always been a part of my personal practice. Enjoy. Uh, um, 
all those things that you named are yoga. If we look at the yoga sutras, it's all in there. Um, I came into it through the posture practice, uh, the asana. And, and uh, over time, because it's in the toolkit, we get exposed to it. Um, and, and so, in other words, it doesn't feel like a scattered energy or scattered attention or a, a dabbling, you know, um, because there's a, a thread holding it all together. Uh, Absolutely. And they touch different aspects of our being. Um, after the yoga classes in Santa Cruz, I would go into the meadows um, looking over Monterey Bay and I would just tone. I had no training in any Sanskrit chanting or singing or, you know, uh, it had sort of a bluesy gospel-y feeling at the time because, you know, that was sort of my influence, I guess. Um, but it was just this a cappella, non-lyrical tone that I would just sit in the meadow because I found after class I couldn't really do much else. <laughs> I found I needed, you know, I needed this quiet space. Um, and, and so vocalizing somehow was very spontaneous. And then when Ramanan teamed up with Pandit Mukesh Desai, doing a yoga and sound, bringing uh, Mukesh Ji as a very trained North Indian classical practice. And so it's, it's, it's quite different in my experience. I, I play music when I practice at home sometimes, but this is quite different to have a very trained uh, voice with somebody who's deeply tuned into breath and energy responding to this moment now. We used to ask him, oh, can you do a recording? He's like, you know, what happened today happened today because it was today because you were here, I was here, and, and no, we can't record that. You know, it's, it's going to be different, you know. And, and uh, so when Ramanan started working with sound, that again was a natural evolution to me. You know, I've been singing with friends since high school and Pop songs, Bob Dylan songs, Grateful Dead songs, and you know, whatever, folk songs, old timey things, dabbled with the banjo for a bit. So singing was always, so that was a natural thing for me, and, and I sought out Mukesh for deeper lessons through the years, and began working more on the kirtan style. Why did I start offering kirtan? Because I wanted people to sing with, <laughs> you know, instead of sort of wondering, uh, I want to sing, you know, but just go out and do it, and who comes, comes. And, and the community of singing is, is wonderful. And it's a non-lyrical expression. Uh, even though we're often chanting names of the divine or verses, a lot of it is just sound. And so what I mean by touching different aspects of us, you know, it's, it's, it's an expressive form, but it's also immersive in, in that it's not following willy-nilly the brain's impulses. You know, it's a repetition. So that has a meditative quality, holding the mind's attention on contemplating the nature of creation and divinity is a meditative intention. And that frees us of, you know, all the chatter that keeps us confused. Um, so, uh, uh, but it's very different than the philosophy discussions. It's not a cognitive thing, right? And Swami Vivekananda said that bhakti, devotion, without the knowledge, without jnana, without understanding, processing, is, is superstition. Jnana, the knowledge, the philosophy, without the bhakti, the devotion, the selfless uh, uh, acceptance and so forth, is, is madness. And so, it's kind of an academic indulgence to separate these things. There's a bhakti path, a jnana path, a karma path, Psychopath, <laughs> you know, it's Swami Dayananda's jokes, but um, they're they're wed together, and, and we all have these aspects in us, and, and and you may as well try to separate, you know, water from the wave to, to separate jnana from bhakti. It's not something that we can do. We're rational beings. We can't tolerate something that doesn't make sense. We have to, you know, process this stuff, and we're emotive, expressive beings, and and tell you room for all these sides of us. So, I didn't, it took years, you know, um, it wasn't uh, sort of seeking out, I need to do this, do this, it, it came my way. Same with the philosophy, Swami, Ramanan Patel turned us on to Swami Dayananda, and one time he said, it's my karma that you all are out there 
<clears throat> wanting to listen to the stuff, it's your karma that I'm here teaching it, you know? How do we find the teachers? That was a beautiful response, that it's various seen and unseen cause and effect, you know? And uh, continuing to seek, you know, and be discerning about how we choose our teachers is very important. So, I had a lot of people teaching Yoga Sutras and Bhagavad Gita before I settled with Swami Dayananda and realized there's no need to look any further. You know, there's a strong tendency in our culture, you know, do something this week, something that week, something this week, you know, <clears throat> mixing up traditions from many different parts of the world because we have that exposure in our, in our, you know, world today. I was a deep scholar of Joseph Campbell's stuff in mythology in my teens in college, you know, and that uniqueness of the 20th century where all of a sudden we have access to each other's stories is, was kind of unprecedented in humanity before. And, and it, it's, it does a weird thing to our head where now we can study Taoism one day and Tantra another day and the Buddhism buffet, another day. Spirituality. Yeah. And there's an honest seeking and it's a beautiful thing to be exposed to. But likewise, at some point, just like a buffet, you know, if you're comfortably full, somebody says, hey, you want more cake? You know, you can honestly say, no, thank you. And, and when there's that fullness in, in, in the teaching that knits it together. There's no need to keep, uh, you know, looking outside and looking elsewhere. So, these are the hard questions. <laughs> okay, last one, I promise. This is good. Um, so, why the Chitta Chats? Why the Chitta Chats? I don't know. Um, it, it seems a natural evolution. Uh, and we don't necessarily have to answer this all at once. This yeah. may be a theme. Yeah. Well, we will explore this in, in video to video, uh, I guess. Um, I found in talking to people like you, other teachers, students who are interested, the dialogue was very interesting. And people who come to my classes say things about the classes and what I'm offering that I would never have come up with. So one reason why, you know, uh, having a talking head podcast or communicating some teachings or a solo teleseminar, I, I, I can't do that well. It seems it was just dry. What's much more interesting to me is, is the dynamic when you're like, why did you teach such and such? I was like, wow, I, I, I never would have asked that question or interesting to know you're thinking that, you know. So... Uh, a lot of things have been happening. I never thought that I would be teaching the Bhagavad Gita and the philosophy when I started going to Swami Dayananda's place. I was just kind of jaw job for the first five years, just, you know, hello. You know, the learning was a lot more listening than talking. Right? We had several hour lectures a day, question and answer in the evening, we write down our questions. But an hour at a time, he's talking. And, uh, and I was just there to absorb this my practice. And I guess, frankly, something really happened when I got hit with the cancer in 2010 and um, was deeply immersed in his home study course and the tapes during that time I was reading Emerson. Uh, how, and I wanted my life to continue, <laughs> even though I was bedridden and couldn't teach asana. So I changed my website to a blog format. The relationship with the students continued. I, 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 it, that was there. The relationship with my practice continued, and and it be became different. You know, it wasn't so much on the asana. It was very much about breath and meditation. Um, and then it came back again. The cancer came back again in 2011. After that treatment, I went back to the ashram for four weeks, the Swami Dayananda's place in Pennsylvania, Arshavidya Gurukulam, and. It was at, coming out of there that I was more clear that. I needed these conversations to continue. And again, I felt this is what I want to spend my time talking about. So how do I do that? Do I wait for somebody to come up who's willing to talk about this? You know, No, I, I just put it out there and who comes, comes. And here you are. <laughs> you know? And not just me. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the, uh, um, it was that Swami uh, Vidit that uh, no, Tatwa Vidananda, I'm getting them mixed up. They have Swami TV and Swami VT there. Um, Swami TV, Tatwa Vidananda, um, said something really struck me. 
He said, we spend so much time talking about all those things we're going to lose. We look at our social conversations, you know. We talk about the movie we liked, the movie we hated, the employee we like, the employee who pushes our buttons, you know, stresses in our relationships. I'm so annoyed at my spouse, boyfriend, brother, sister. Uh, likes and dislikes, you know, we, those fleeting things. And there's a lot of beauty in that sharing. I mean, I don't, it's not to diminish that. It's not a, a, a criticism. Um, but oftentimes, we'll, we, we, it is, this is the nirodaha, the discernment in our thoughts that we talked about in looking at the, at the sutras. Um, we do something, an incident that could have happened ages ago, and I still need to sort of, you know, take up your time with it, right? And, and you may or may not want to listen, you know, for some reason it's still bothering, you know. So looking at those things is, is part of it. But he said we spend so much time talking about all those things that we're going to lose. Why not spend one... You know, you're talking about that one thing that you will never lose. Meaning you're, you're the nature of your being. That which outlasts everything. That from which we come and return to. And I was just like, wow. Yeah, why not? You know, what more would I rather spend time talking about? And sure enough, you know, you put that on the table and you find those, it lights other people up. And, and, and why talk about it? Because it lights me up. It, uh, a lot of other things, you know, and this was true before the cancer, but maybe that, I say cancer ripened me, you know, it, 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 it um, because some things, there was just no time for other stuff, the interest, it's not a matter of lack of patience for it, I want to be there to listen to somebody who needs to hear something, and I can do that, you know, but, uh, you know, the stronger interest in, in this kind of sharing is, is really high. Likewise with the singing, likewise with the meditation, with the asana practice. There is a desire to share. And why the Chitta Chats, both in the tea house and in the video, um, I'm, the form of things changes. But the spirit behind it we want to try to keep true. And I was kind of influenced by one of Swami Dayananda's articles on spirit and form. <clears throat> You know, that talks about, through time, cultures change, our social structures change. We don't have in San Francisco, well, there are some sort of ashram places, but it's not really endemic in our culture to have a residential place with teachers. And our culture doesn't have a spot for spiritual teachers in our economy, right? I've had a day job throughout all my yoga teaching. <clears throat> you know, it's not a, a career per se, you know. Um, and Swami Dayananda talks about how, you know, wearing the orange clothes and, and he's on a plane. Somebody says, hey, what's your trip? You know, he says, I'm going to L.A. He says, no, 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 what, what, what do you mean? You know, what, what's up with the orange, whatever, you know. He says, okay, well, ask me an honest question. <laughs> but he says, he, he started talking what he does, I'm going to teach, why are you going there? They asked me to come. You know, where do you live? Oh, I, you know, here, there, Coimbatore, Rishikesh, Pennsylvania. You don't own a house? No. You don't have a family? No. You don't earn any income? No. Oh, so you're a hobo. <laughs> <laughs> so in this culture, no home, no job, no income, you know, you're a hobo. He says, I'm a holy hobo, but I still have to be a hobo. <laughs> in India, same questions. You got no home, got no family, got no house. Oh, you're a sadhu. Mm -hmm. So he says, there in that culture, I have a spot. So the form changes in our culture, how we have these dialogues have to be different. And, you know, one thing he also drilled into us is to keep the spirit true, there has to be a lot of understanding and training. So I guess I've been somewhat cautious about that. And uh, until this dialogue started coming organically, and I still maintain I'm doing less teaching than inquiring together. The texts are how do we together unpack the meaning in the texts and base largely on method of people like Swami Dayananda. So instead of finding a place, you know, to do these teachings, I was walking by this tea house, Om Shanti, the name was appropriate. <laughs> and uh, I just thought, you know, why don't we just meet there? And um, so adapting the form to fitting with people's schedules, uh, you know, people are way too busy now. I have done six, eight week, you know, Bhagavad Gita courses at my home and uh, things like that, but 
It's just the motivation to find people to, to be present for those who are curious, because they'll show up, they'll find it. It's not going out, you know, looking for people to talk about it with. Um, so, and chitta, uh, just to, some of you may know, chitta means consciousness, or <clears throat> that consciousness in which all the world becomes evident to me. And that consciousness that is self-aware. And that's a pretty unique thing. There's nothing in the world that, that is self-evident other than I am. That I am needs no other thing to become known to me. Everything else that I discover is an object of my perception or an object of my cognitive inference. So chitta is that consciousness that is self-aware and is the consciousness that includes everything like memory. And so <clears throat> adapting to our culture, having some sort of cute tagline. <laughs> Chitta chats. Meaning. Yeah, chitta chats kind of came spontaneously, and uh, I thought go with it. Why not? Thank you, Sal. Thank you.